Welcome everybody. We're really thrilled for the opportunity to be able to talk about this important topic um, together. The topic of this talk here, the idea of aiming higher in science education, um, already suggests that we're not aiming high enough. And when you have a look at the media reports, it's pretty easy to do a quick Google search on science teaching or science education. And the things that pop up are not a pretty picture of how um, science, science education, science participation is being represented in the media. Section one, participation. So this is about enrolment in equivalent year 12 um, subjects in science. And what we've done is um, group those different areas in terms of, uh, well, you can see there's agriculture, biology, chemistry, earth science. When you look at this data, the purple is girls and the green is boys. And you can see from that a little enrolment graph there in terms of percent of all enrolments, there's slightly more girls studying science than there are boys. However, the greatest number of enrolments in a science subject of those three is biology followed by chemistry and, unsurprisingly, the lowest there in terms of um, physics and astronomy. And then this data comes from the Australian Mathematical Sciences Institute, publishing about mathematics participation. You'll see participation rates of students in intermediate and high maths has been declining over time. And again, high maths, lowest proportion of girls out of all the maths levels. <clears throat> What are some of the reasons behind this data and how do we start to unpick it? Strikingly, socioeconomic status was a big predictor. We also found that in terms of Indigenous participation was a negative predictor in biology, physics and chemistry, but not in earth space sciences and gender being a significant predictor as we just saw in those graphs. These factors don't operate in isolation necessarily. Um, they can come together in something that we would call um, intersectionality and those effects of those factors can be multiplied. Well, what else influences? Many other things and I've just chosen um, three here um, to talk about. The ATAR is a game for a lot of students in terms of which subjects to teach to maximise their study scores to get into particular university courses. Science identity is also really important in terms of how do I see myself as a science person? And this was an interesting um, bit of extra information that we located around COVID-19 that it seems to have a, actually a positive impact on people's perceptions of scientists doing all that great work in immunology, for example. So participation is one thing, choosing to participate in one of these science or math subjects, but also interest is another driver, interest in maths, and science declines over time, and it doesn't start very high. And then um, liking science, well, it's a little bit more hopeful there, but again, declining over time. And now here's the part where I go like this to Jan, and... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> oh, and you need this. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Mandy. I'll um, talk a little bit, we're focusing now from, in this part of the talk on, on what's happening in school science education. Uh, in Australia and Victoria, but also um, a bit of a global uh, perspective. One of the things, of course, that is very typical of science and, and probably quite unique compared to other school subjects is the enormous amount of knowledge that has been produced in science in the last 100 years, 150 years, and is continuing to be produced on a daily basis. In the same amount of time, we need to cover an enormous amount of knowledge. And that is, of course, impossible. So what has happened is that you have to reduce the amount of time that you spend on each topic. So it has to become more superficial and it has to become quicker. What you also see in curriculum around the world is that the cohesion between the science subjects is not optimal. And of course, if you have very little time, the traditional ways of teaching and assessment uh, are still very clearly present in, in classrooms around the world. A lot of students perceive science as being difficult and stressful. It's often reported in many studies that students don't see what the relevance is for science in for their world or for their future. And that leads to interest declines over time and attitudes being really problematic. COVID happened. And one of the things that was already happening before COVID, but was of course exacerbated by COVID, was the spread of misinformation, especially misinformation about science. We actually rarely teach 
students, how they can understand the knowledge that is produced, whether that can be trusted. Students get their information, overwhelming majority of their information, not from science teachers, not from textbooks, but they get it from the internet, they get it from social media, and increasingly through AI. They may be digitally very capable, but they are novices when it comes to evaluating the information that they encounter, the information about science, but of course also other information. Shouldn't we address how expertise, how, how, how they can uh, recognize expertise, how they know whether somebody who's interviewed is an expert on that topic. So some really good food for thought about what that means for the science that we teach and how we teach it. And that's where I give it back to Mandy. Great, thank you. So I'm gonna talk about some pedagogical approaches and also some curriculum approaches. And in terms of pedagogy, different kinds of approaches to teaching and learning have been introduced in a way to try to engage and interest and motivate students' learning um, about science. Other solutions, and same with pedagogy internationally, there have been different ways in which curricular interventions have been introduced to try to um, bring science more into a contemporary science content. STEM education has really grown a lot in popularity in schools. It's interesting to think about the different sorts of influences on what STEM education means. Clearly, there was a push, political, economic push. We need more people to be doing um, senior science courses. We need more people to be graduating with science degrees. But there's also a, another and maybe parallel, maybe sometimes contrasting view about Actually, it's about giving students the opportunity to have a good educational experience of understanding the world around them through a STEM lens, not necessarily just pushing through the so-called pipeline of um, further careers. Often it gets associated with this development of these different kinds of skills and abilities that has not been traditionally part of a science curriculum. I've seen a quite fascinating through schools, different ways of profiling themselves through STEM, either trying to get more um, students in because they're saying they're a STEM school or using particular equipment or just actually embracing the idea that there's something really important and good we can do for our students. While there are ideas across the Australian and Victorian curriculum about how to bring STEM in, there's actually no formal STEM curriculum and um, there's limited teacher professional learning um, in STEM. I know there's lots of great things out there, but compared with what um, else is on offer, it's limited. All right, that's the end of my section and you're back on again. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. So focusing on the role of teachers, the role of science teachers, around the world there's an estimate of about 80 million people are employed as teachers and another 68 to join by 2030. In Australia, we have around 400,000 teachers in primary, early childhood and secondary education. The last information on this slide I think is particularly worrying if you see that the percentage of teachers in Australia that plan to leave or consider to leave the profession was already very high in 2019 and is a lot higher even then. So whether or, you know, you can only imagine what COVID did to that, but it's, that's, that's a big worry, of course. Nicole Mottler is a colleague from the University of Sydney, and she did a very interesting study, I think. She analyzed news articles from the last 25 years, and she selected every article that had the word teacher more than three times. Her analysis shows that the way that teachers that be, are being represented in the media, in those newspapers, is overwhelmingly negative. A fixation on teacher quality, representation where teachers' work is made to be look very simple, which it isn't, and there's a lot of negativity around teachers. And so if we look at good teaching, what does that actually mean? From a subject matter perspective, so teaching particular content like science, the first one speaks for itself, but it's not evident. Not every science teacher understands their subject matter thoroughly or thoroughly enough. They need to know how students learn the subject matter and how students sometimes struggle to learn the subject matter. And knowing that, they need to have a repertoire of strategies that they can draw on. But the most important thing is knowing what to do when and in which context, because a classroom situation is not predictable. That's why teaching is so inherently complex. It's never the same. So teachers need to develop their expertise. They need to develop this, this special pedagogical content knowledge. And of course, that's what we try to do in teacher education programs. But those programs necessarily only lead to a particular starting point. There's two sides to it that need to develop. Every teacher, like every professional, needs routines to develop. But at the same time, you need to move along that other axis. You need to innovate. So beginning teachers may be somewhere where the word optimal is, and you want them to move up to become what we call adaptive experts. And we will continue on this positive note now that I give back to Mandy. 
So what do science teachers need? Well, first of all, people talk about having professional development and resources. And of course, professional development and resources are important. However, what we often see, especially at the moment, is the kind of professional development that is happening in a lot of schools comes from mandates to do certain things with all teachers. So it becomes a kind of one size fits all, doesn't matter what stage of your career that you're at, because we all have to do something around X. So in order to be able to have that opportunity for professional development that kind of hits where you are in your career and what it is that you're interested in developing is less and needs to be paid more attention to. Some other things that teachers need, opportunities for trying things out and for things not to work all of the time and have time to evaluate and reflect on the work that they're doing. Ideally, they're doing it in collaboration with others opportunities to get, engage in research and support and facilitation. We put this um, last dot point in as a bit of an interesting provocation, relief from tasks that others can do, AI for instance. So you might be thinking about the ways in which AI can be supportive. What are the ways in which maybe AI might be interesting in helping diagnose student learning difficulties or coming up with different approaches to address where students are in their learning? So ways forward, being able to use the curriculum flexibly, giving students opportunities for choices, less stuff and more focus on big ideas. And of course, this is already happening in schools about that, that shifting the culture around um, telling people what they need to know um, compared with giving students the opportunity to learn and question and investigate for themselves. And how to make science teaching more attractive. How do we start to value teachers for their specialist expertise? And that idea of professional space, how do teachers get the space to collaborate, to think, to try things out, to evaluate and reflect, and let teachers focus on the students and their learning and appreciation of science. So we appreciate very much your attention. So thank you.